Okay, so continuing Colossians, and really, chapter 2, if you take away the chapter divisions, um, you can see that Colossians 1.24 through Colossians 2.5 are really all one thought. So I'm going to just um, pick up here at 124. We've already covered a lot of this, but um, who now rejoice in my son. See, he was made a minister. Okay, For, what do we see? We saw that the goal of God or the will of God is to make Christ preeminent in all things. And in the old creation, he is preeminent as the firstborn, meaning the heir, the one who created all things and, and the one in whom all things consist. And then in the new creature creation, remember the old creation was an incubator to produce the new creation, which is the church. Christ is head over his body, the church, and he is the firstborn from among the dead. And we saw that through the new creation, God's intention is that Christ would have the preeminence of all things, meaning he is literally the point of reference for everything. He's the center. Now, in the old creation, for God, that was true, because he has not done anything apart from Christ. He's never made anything that he didn't make through Christ. He's never expressed himself in a way that wasn't in Christ, right? But then, to launch the new creation, he incarnated himself and took on flesh and blood and partook of elements of the old creation. And that is his humanity which was made out of the dust of the earth just like ours but then he glorified that humanity and resurrection and now there is this created there's a merging of the created and the uncreated in christ and the reason for this was because he wants to make himself the head or he wants to make his son the father wants to make jesus christ the head over a body called the church through which he will fill all things with himself. So we see that in Ephesians at the end of the chapter where it says um, that the church is his body. In chapter 1, the church, of his, church is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. His body, the church, is his fullness. And through his fullness, he's going to come to occupy the central place not only for God, but for all creation. That's really what we're being perfected into and growing into, and we say we're being headed up. And that comes from Ephesians 1.10, where it talks about how God's administration of the fullness of times is to head up all things in Christ in the heavens and in the earth. And he had to reconcile these things through the blood of Christ because there had been a collapse and a... Um, alienation and so through the blood of christ god reconciled the creation to himself uh starting with us so that's why it turns to and you has he reconciled right we were alienated and we were uh, hostile in our mind and we were alienated from god through our wicked works and yet he has reconciled us through the blood of christ and uh this is for the purpose of making us one with Christ and bringing Christ to us so that then Christ can become preeminent to us. Um, and the way he does this, number one, is organically by being the head of the body and regenerating every member with his life. And number two, through the New Testament ministry, which is according to the revelation that God gave uh first Paul and then the apostles and the saints that it's all the riches of the glory of Christ in you the hope of glory this is the mystery which had been hidden from all creation from men from angels it was hidden in the heart of God and now God has brought it out to light and he has a new testament ministry and we saw that Paul's um Paul is the uh minister who had a dispensation from god 
And we talked about his economy to dispense himself into us. And we talked about how Paul suffered for this, right? So that's where we were. Um, and so, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things to himself, right? By him, whether they be things on earth or in heaven, and you who are sometimes alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and not being moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So there's a New Testament ministry to bring the sons of God into God's presence without spot in Christ. And he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. And we talked about his sufferings. And we talked about how in Second Corinthians he talks about the purpose of those sufferings having to do with the tearing down of his natural man, the consuming of the natural man, and the renewing of the inner man, the renewing of the spirit, so that death is working in him, but life in those he ministers to. And that's what really produces New Testament epistles of Christ. Uh, people who have been transformed with Christ himself. Uh, therefore, then he says, of this gospel I've made a minister, or no, of this church I've been made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill or to complete the word of God, even the mystery which has been hidden from ages and generations, but it's now manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man full grown or perfect in Christ Jesus. Un whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. So you can see that the working of God to dispense himself, according to his dispensation, right, into the body of Christ to make Christ head over each of us to all things, I'm sorry, in all things, and make us be the kind of people that are fully occupied with Christ, takes a ministry through which the power of God can operate. And that's what Paul had. Um, and his goal was that, was that every man would be presented full grown, that's the way, uh, the translation I'm used to says full grown in Christ Jesus. And uh, that means that Christ is preeminent to you. You are no longer in any way at odds with Christ, but he is your point of reference and he is the way you handle everything, just like he is already the way God handles everything. And that's really what we see in Colossians as we'll continue he becomes the center and the point of reference. I don't deal with myself apart from Christ. I don't deal with my relationships apart from Christ. I don't deal with God, definitely, apart from Christ. I don't deal with the law apart from Christ. I don't deal with the Bible apart from Christ. I know everything in Christ. Everything has to be that I would grow into him in all things and he would become everything to me. And there's a hymn uh, everything is in Christ and Christ is everything that's based on this. That's a great hymn. Let me see if I can find that real quick. Everything is in Christ and Christ is everything. Oh, this is called Once It Was the Blessing. Once it was the blessing, now it is the Lord. Once it was the feeling, now it is his word. Once his gift I wanted, now the giver own. Once I sought for healing, now himself alone. All and all, forever, only Christ I'll sing. Everything is in Christ, and Christ is everything. Once was painful trying, now is perfect trust. Well, I don't have to read all this. Um, the point is, you can see that this person is talking about how he transitioned from wanting things from God, like the blessings or the feelings or um, his gifts or for healing, and it instead came to realize that he had to have the Lord himself. The Lord 
is the answer. Christ is the answer. He is what God has to give. And that is a major realization to see that all the attributes that we seek are in Christ and he is the reality of everything we desire. So we just need to pursue Christ. We don't pursue righteousness. We don't pursue peace. We don't pursue holiness apart from Christ, but we see that Christ is the reality of these things and we learn to partake of him and lay hold of him for all these things because he is all these things. All in all forever, only Christ I'll sing. Everything is in Christ and Christ is everything. Um, so anyway, that's the goal of the New Testament ministry is to produce those kind of people. And I haven't met that many kind of people like that. I've met some, but not that many, especially in a long time. But, I, you know, I do see on it, on YouTube some people that seem to be really desiring that Christ would be their everything. Um, but it's a revelation. It's a vision. It's being filled with the full knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding that allows you to see the will of God. That Christ would be everything to not only God, but to us. That's what the new creation is all about. In the old creation, there was Christ. But in the new creation, Christ is everything. That's the difference. And he is everything as life in resurrection, incorruptible. And that's why we live forever. <laughs> it's because we have this one who's imperishable. He's been given to us. Um, okay, so Colossians 2, 1, we're just continuing the thought. For I would that you know what a great conflict I have for you and for those at Laodicea, and as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. And from what I understand in the Greek, and I'm not a Greek person, but the, the recovery version says acknowledgement of the mystery of God, which is Christ. And I think that's accurate. It's um, the mystery of God is Christ. There's two major mysteries. And Paul said, you know, consider us stewards of the mysteries of God, right? Well, there is the mystery of God and there's the mystery of Christ. And what is mystery? The Greek word is mysterion, which doesn't mean that God's hiding something from you. He's hiding something for you. And he hid some things that now he's declaring and revealing openly through the gospel. And the first thing that was hidden and unknowable was God. God was unknowable except through Jesus Christ. And we had to wait till the fullness of the times for Jesus Christ to be incarnated to live out the divine attributes in his human virtues so that we could know and understand what God is like. So he is the revelation of God. And he said, no one knows the father except the only begotten, or no one has ever seen the father except the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father. He has revealed him. And when he came, he said, when you've seen me, you've seen the father. Believe you not that I am in the father and the father is in me. The words that I speak, I don't speak of myself, but my Father in me, he does the works. And so this is the revelation of God. Jesus Christ is the mystery of God. Christ is the mystery of God. Christ is the way that God handles everything, and he is the way that God is expressed. He is the express image of God. He's the image of the invisible God, as it says in Colossians. And so we can know God because we know Christ. Apart from Christ, God's a mystery. You can make up any kind of story you want, you won't understand him. Until you get to the person of Jesus Christ, you have not seen God on the ground that he wants to reveal himself to his creation with all of his attributes, right? Um, so that's the mystery of God. And what is the mystery of Christ? Well, the mystery of Christ is the church, and that's what Ephesians deals with. Ephesians talks about how God's intention, his eternal purpose, is to have the church be built up to be his habitation and spirit and the manifestation of his wisdom to the angels, the 
display of the unsearchably rich Christ in his body, which is the church. We see the man Jesus, and through him we can know God. But we don't understand that Jesus Christ is unsearchably rich, and this person is designated to be put on display in his body. And the way the angels are to really apprehend who this person is, is he's being put on display in the church. So just as Christ is the mystery of God because God is put on display in Christ, Christ is put on display through the church, and the church is the mystery of Christ. And that's what Paul says in Ephesians 3 when he talks about, uh, I'm sorry, hold on, um, Ephesians 3, Look at this. He's talking about the dispensation again, right? If you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me for you, how by revelation he made known to me the mystery, where uh, which I wrote in a few words, meaning the first couple chapters, all the things he said about the church as the habitation of God, as the body of Christ, as the sons of God, as the inheritance of God, as the new man. There were so many items in Ephesians 1 and 2 concerning the church and what it really is in God's heart. And he says, whereby when you read these things, you might understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So this is the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it was now revealed to his holy prophets and apostles in spirit. So there's the mystery of Christ, which is the church. And that's what Ephesians deals with. And Colossians is dealing with the mystery of God, which is Christ. The mystery of God is Christ, and the mystery of Christ is the church. And these are the two books that deal with these two mysteries. And that's why they're so dense and so unsearchable. These books go on and on and on. I mean, we're just scratching the surface of what's revealed in these books. Um, so then he says that their hearts may be comforted being knit together in love and unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding unto the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. Christ. That's how I see that. I think, and of the Father, and of the, uh, is not in all the manuscripts. And you could say that this is the King James, therefore it's authoritative, and it doesn't change anything. Th these prepositions, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I really do believe that here it's talking about Christ is the mystery of God. Just as First Timothy, he says, great is the mystery of godliness. He was seen by angels. He came in the flesh. He was raised up into glory, right? It's a person. The mystery of God, the mystery of godliness is a person. It is the manifestation of God in the flesh. And that is how God finally revealed himself to a world that didn't know him, is by incarnating himself into humanity as the man, Jesus Christ, the God-man. Um, and it is in his... So this is God's desire, or Paul's desire. His ministry, his struggle, is number one, to present us full-grown in Christ by our hearts being comforted and knit together in love. So it's in fellowship. There has to be a proper atmosphere for this knowledge. This is not just intellectual knowledge. This is a knowledge apprehended by a group of people who are in fellowship. That's why fellowship is so important and the condition of the heart is so important. It's because it's in that realm that we come into the riches of the full assurance of understanding. It's one thing to understand something. It's another thing to have full assurance of understanding. You might see that Christ is supposed to be everything to you, but you don't believe it. I don't believe it. In my marriage, when I have a struggle, or at home, when I have a struggle, what is my point of reference? I had to be admonished recently that I need to take Christ and stop taking responsibility for my own situation and trying to fix it. When I'm trying to fix it, I'm in the flesh. I'm actually hindering Christ's ability to get in there and deal with the situation. I have to stop looking at myself and whether or not, you know, when my wife and I are arguing or whatever, you know, feeling guilty and looking inward and being, you know, manipulating and trying to make the other person feel guilty, all of that stuff has nothing to do with Christ. Taking Christ, it first means I surrender my own responsibility for this thing. 
and I see that Christ has made himself responsible and he wants to be my life. The mystery is Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ in me is how God wants to handle everything in my life. He wants it to be no longer I who live, but Christ in me. And uh, that's what this is. The riches of the full assurance of understanding is when you start actually being perfected, full grown in Christ, where you really do take Christ as your point of reference, as how you handle everything, so that more and more Christ comes out and he's put on display and not just you. And this is not for an individual, but this is for a group of people because he wants to be made known in the church so that their hearts may be comforted being knit together in love and unto all the riches of full assurance under the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of Christ, or the mystery of God, which is Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest anyone should beguile you with enticing words. Now he's going to get into a little later in this chapter that the chief way that the enemy attacks the church is through doctrines of men that try to take you captive and lead you away from Christ as the answer for everything and lead you into human methods. And that's why the institutional churches are filled with marriage seminars and financial seminars and uh, all kinds of different things that it's one thing it, to teach you life skills. We need life skills. But if you think that a patchwork of life skills is going to make you into a better Christian, that is absolutely not the case. Life skills are for survival and taking care of this vessel. But that does not make a mature Christian. And unfortunately, these programs end up replacing Christ entirely. And people get shuffled around in the programs and are not being perfected in Christ, not seeing any kind of vision of Christ, and definitely not learning to take hold of him, uh, not being headed up in him. They're just being shuffled around in different classes. And, you know, you get people who can suddenly teach classes, but they can't, they can't minister the word. There's no ministry. This kind of revelation comes out of the New Testament ministry. And it takes a person who has struggled and had a conflict for those that he's trying to bring this revelation out in the midst of most likely it attacks, slander, accusation, right? And aware that there's wolves trying to lead people away from Christ, thieves in the midst of the sheepfold trying to steal crowns, and it causes them to agonize. That's what Paul was. And this agony is what produced his ministry. The burden we have that people would come to the gospel as their source and would repudiate everything false and be saved from error. That's life or death stuff for a genuine minister of the gospel. Everybody else is a hireling, you know, that runs when they see the wolf coming. Um, but a suffering servant like Paul he stayed with it and that's why he suffered he could have just run you know but he stayed with it uh okay so in christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and this i say lest anyone should beguile you with enticing words for though i'm absent in the flesh yet i'm with you in the spirit joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in christ so there's three things he's observed from of the Colossians that he mentions. In chapter 1, he mentions that he beheld their faith and he heard of their faith and the uh, in the Lord Jesus and the love which they have for all the saints, which proved that they were a genuine church that had the evidence of the eternal life. And then later in that epistle, he said, even as we've heard of your love in the spirit from Epaphras. So he knew of their love which was not just a nicey, nicey political love, but it was the genuine love in the spirit, which recognizes the sons of God by their testimony, right? We talked about that. And then there's this, I am no, I'm not I'm absent in the flesh, but I'm with you in the spirit, beholding and joying, joying and beholding your order. How? Through the fellowship. See, they had fellowship with Epaphras and Epaphras had fellowship with Paul. This fellowship is not limited to time and space. It's not our uh, space. I'm sorry. It's not limited to geography. It is transferred from person to person in communication. And when Epaphras came, 
Paul could tell that Epaphras was refreshed by his presence with them, and when Epaphras was talking about them, he had a taste of a of their spirit in Epaphras' speaking. And if you think about that, and if you've ever taken care of someone or been concerned about someone's condition, and you hear that, yeah, they got saved from that thing and they're doing better, there is a sense in you. You can sense that they're doing better. Like any of you who are on my YouTube channel and we've gone through struggle with a few different people, and we've seen some fall away and we've seen some get clear and you've been involved in that in the conversations and stuff you can know exactly what i'm talking about you know even though you don't see them you know how they're doing you just know i don't know how to describe it beyond that it's in the fellowship um though i'm absent in the flesh yet i'm with you in spirit joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in christ see once again he's telling them look you're doing well and later he's going to tell them you're complete in christ don't let anyone take you captive you've already got the crown you already have everything you need all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in christ and christ is everything everything is in christ and christ is everything don't let anyone beguile you i want you to know that i know that you're doing well I'm rejoicing and beholding your order. There's no rebuke here. There is just a warning not to fall away from the position they're standing in, the steadfastness in Christ. Okay, uh, I'll talk to you later.